So welcome to tonight's public program, part of Summer School 2021. Uh, I'm very happy that tonight we have uh, the presentation of two artists, uh, Julieta Aranda uh, and David Collins. Julieta is also running a course this year. Uh, once again, thank you very much for being with us uh, in this time. I'm just going to read briefly something from her last biography initially. So in her artistic practice, Julieta Aranda the sensorial encounters with the nature of time and speculative literature. She observes the altering human earth relationship through the lens of technology, artificial intelligence, space travel, and scientific hypothesis. Working with installations, sculpture, video, and print, and print media, she's invested in exploring the potential of science fiction, alternative economies, and the poetics of circulation. Her projects challenge the boundaries between subject and object while embracing chance encounters auto destruction social processes. There's a number of exhibitions that Julieta shows uh, extensively. I will not name them here. I'll just read a bit about the presentation tonight, if I may. So the presentation is called We Made Such a Mess. Uh, uh, in this presentation, uh, Julieta will examine our relationship as beings, as humans, as artists, as cultural workers to the toxic environments that we have created. How can we negotiate life flourishing in the poison landscapes of industrial capitalism? As we focus on planetary ecological concerns as subject matter for artistic production, we need to also make sure to produce the ecologies that we need for the art tools to be a viable, livable system. What Aranda is trying to say is that to be able to produce sustainable futures, we need firstly to produce sustainable presents. And looking at the presence in which we are living without reiterating into nostalgic imaginaries, what kind of formulations of hope can we offer to them? This is a question in the end. Thank you so much again. The, the floor is yours. Okay, I know that um, we are a bit pressed for time, so I'm not going to do very many introductions. We are to do the first show of film. Um, that's called uh, Leap, Deep, Paint, Talk, uh, Your Mouth is Sleeping. Uh, it's a work I uh, finished a couple of years ago uh, when I was, I was thinking uh, based on the story of uh, the brain girls and brain boys that were happening in the early 20th century. So um, maybe we should we look at that and then I want to read um, from a glossary uh, text that I uh, recently wrote. Uh, let's see how far along can we get in that. So, um, I start with the film now and we can turn on the lights.
it's easy. See? You take your little brush here, twirl it between your lips to make a point, then dip it into the powder here. Why does it shine? There's a little radium in there. The running joke was how we loved. The handkerchiefs we sneezed into, lighting up our purses when we opened them at night. Our lips and nails painted for our boyfriends as a joke, simmering white as ash in a dark room. Would you die for science? The reporter asked us. Science? We mixed up glue, water, and radiant powder into a glowing greenish-white paint and painted watch dials with a little brush, one number after another, taking one dial after another all day long from the rack sitting next to our chairs. After a few strokes, the brush lost shape, and our bosses told us to point it with our lips. Was that science? to work in a bank and thought I'd got class, more money, a better life, until I lost a tooth in back and two in front, and my jaw filled up with sores. We sued, but when we got to court, not one of us could raise our arms to take the oath. My teeth were gone by then. Pretty Grace Friar, they called me in the papers. All of us were dying.
We heard the scientist in France, Marie Curie, could not believe the manner in which we worked and how we tasted that pretty paint a hundred times a day. Now, even our crumbling bones will glow forever in the black earth. Recently, um, I've been working very much with uh, ocean uh, as a software, let's say, from what I uh, feel like inspiration. I think a lot of that started from um, uh, something that's called ghost fishing. And that's what happens when uh, fishing nets from trawler ships and from fishing boats the broken and discovered at sea. And they continue fishing, but there is, I mean, they continue killing animals at sea, but so fishing in a sense, but all sense of responsibility for that fishing has, is kind of like diluted, and it's very easy to say what well, I have to do with it, I'm not the one that's fishing. And that stayed in my mind. Um, the, the, the way in which um, oceans are embodiments of circulation spaces and of uh, this uh, massive um, uh, like burial grounds and uh, uh, where life starts and where life ends in a sense. So um, there is a text I wrote um, in, the, in the form of a glossary uh, together with an anthropologist, uh, Eric Gertzi, uh, last year. So, I wanted to go over a couple of the terms that we uh, that we touched upon um, to talk about uh, toxicities. And uh, so the first uh, term is A, that is for amphibious, and that is B, that's the one we want to get into. Um, that's um, yeah, thoughts, um, bodies, and biopolitics. By speaking about the ocean, invoking some of the bodies that inhabit it, we invoke the disappear, the decay, the poison, the water gone, the bodies that float back to the surface and haunt us. May 10, 1816, Rua Benjamin recalls the middle passage somewhere between the door of the return and the new world. Mostly there was silence and the murmurs of those who were trying to make sense of where we are. In several dialects, I understood the words aliens, catastrophe, abduction, and jump. All of us packed so tightly. Lying on my back, I cannot bend my knees without bumping the slab of wood holding the person above me. Finally, it's time to go above deck for the afternoon meal. But most of my confinements refused to leave the daily ration of rational uh, horse beans. Just then, I felt a chain around my ankle jack and caught the eye of the man, the woman on the end of the line. In seconds, we all made it overboard and hovering over the rest of the sea. I looked back at the alien ship. One last time, we flew away. September 6, 2001. Willem Corwin, a 32-year-old black man, is cut into seven pieces and dumped into the sea. The large plastic bag holding his body bulges with gas and flows in the water near a palm fringe beach in West Papua. 
Why the shooting eyes stared on focus at the man with the camera? His mouth gaze open in a distorted yawn. A jumble of seven different body parts are in the back. Two legs, two arms, his head, and torso, and two pieces of the body struck. Memory surfaces from another moment in time, when 157 indigenous people were dumped off a ship in nearby waters. Taken to bodies washed ashore in the beautiful beaches of the island. Strange food. A couple boat glides across the water surface, smooth as a mirror. The ship ferries fresh and salty dreams, mostly grown in developing countries. Gigi and Rambutan from Indonesia, Brazilian limes, dragon fruit from Vietnam, pineapples, passion fruit, pineapples and bananas, all grow below decks with a soft kiss that will the global south. Logistics experts from each country of origin must adhere to strict requirements to ensure that the pallets inside the river containers arrive at destinations without malaria mosquitoes or the risk of corruption, hunger, and civil war to ruin the food. New flavors satisfy increasing demands. No compromises can be accepted when it comes to hygiene. Temperatures must be controlled. April 18, 2015. In the middle of the night, the international waters between Libya and the Italian island of Lampedusa, a nameless wooden boat issues a distress signal, invoking the international law of the sea. The boat, a former fishing trawler, carries upwards of 1,100 migrants who are trying to reach Europe. Alerted by the Italian Coast Guard, the King Jacob, a Portuguese container ship that is 147 meters long, comes to the rescue. The two boats collide. This collision happens on more than one plane simultaneously. Up until a few minutes before the encounter, the boats were navigating parallel oceans. Only one of those oceans, the one through which, through which goods is, are transported, is considered fully visible. The other ocean, the one with its very black and brown bodies toward Fortress Europe, is more clandestine and much more cruel. Opportunists with faulty navigation instruments trafficking people amid shifting legislation, greed, and the flow of capital. After the collision of both boats and both oceans, hundreds of bodies began to sink into the Mediterranean. Dressed as from the seabed, some 370 meters below, they joined the subhuman sea state with other decomposing evidence of European necropolitics. June 30, 2016. One last image. A nameless wooden boat arrives in the port of Augusta, Sicily. It had been hoisted to the surface at a cost of 9.5 million euros. The boat was given a name, Barca Nostra, our boat. But who are we that own that boat? The boat was shown as a ready name at the 2019 Denis Bayena. One person's death goes into circulation as another person's work of art. Another term, yes. Uh, circulation, see, now, and to be a rubber dog. Plastic flotsam and jetsam has been moving across the seas for nearly 100 years, navigating ocean currents converging into the Pacific vortex. An undead plastic bag speaks to Werner Herzog about its journey in a solid way. Alone on a beach, the bag says. No one needs me here anymore, not even my name. After a previous voyage, after swimming with jellyfish past monstrous leviathans, the bag sings. And I was born again. I learned to use the currents of the water as I could use the currents of the wind. I made it to the vortex. I was with my own kind. We covered an area the size of a small continent. We were free and happy. I love going, I, I love going in circles, in circles. Circles. Pick up a piece of sun bleached plastic from the shore and test it for legibility. Build the little flakes with your fingernail as if you were scraping a palimpsest, uncovering layers of paint. Hydrocarbon is of a dinosaur, you say. They are under the plankton I counter, the weaponized fossil kin of soy dog. Look again, then, squint your eyes just right. You're holding a timepiece. Diamonds last forever. 
January 10, 1990. A cargo ship traveling from Hong Kong to Washington lost a dozen cargo containers when they were washed overboard in the storm in the North Pacific Ocean. Bath of toys, some 28 thousand red beavers, blue turtles, green frogs, and yellow dogs began traveling on oceanic currents. The dogs were actually plastic, not rubber. The initial landfall was in Alaska. Some of the plastic animals bought back east to Japan, Indonesia, and Australia. Some got stuck in Arctic ice. Others eventually washed ashore in Europe. Reached by sun and sea water, the dogs and beavers had faded to white, but the turtles and frogs should embrace the marines of 30 years ago. White dogs continue to tumble in the Pacific vortex, completing a circuit every three years. There are plastic bodies that cannot be put to rest. Imagine if they could be liberated from, from this undead mass, this endless circulation. I spun around so fast that I was free, says Herzog, as the plastic bag tumbles away from the vortex in search of its maker. Like a fool, I still don't hope that we meet him again. And if I do, I will tell him just one thing. I wish that you had created me so that I could die. And the last one that I mentioned is um, the topic that stands for uh, the letter B is double death. Um, that's something I've been discussing with the uh, uh, students of my seminar. Um, so, life is becoming non life on a planetary scale. Psychological communities, associations of predators and prey, omnivorous scavengers, parasites and hosts, normally depend on ongoing intergenerational cycles of life and death. The food web is premised on reciprocity among species. Life usually offers an intergenerational gift with that. And here I think we can look at. Wow! I can do that. Well, well. Twitter. 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 Twitter.
one of the main targets of Australia's widespread chemical campaign is the INCO, which is a companion animal species for Aboriginal Australians. Humans, <coughs> humans share basic biology with the INCO. If you were to eat one of the poison baits used in this campaign, a compound known as uh, 1080, uh, you would experience nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, sweating, confusion, agitation, followed by cardiac abnormalities, seizures, and unconsciousness. You would become progressively impaired over a few hours. Eventually, you would fall into a coma and die. Countless of animals killed by 1080 continue to kill others in the afterlife. Double death reverberates to ecosystems as living creatures feed on poison carrion for sustenance. As the poison moves through generations and across the species lines, life becomes non life. Death daily poison is just one industrial problem among many others that are producing double death on a planet scale. Our oceans are full of double death. The seas are awash with fungicides, insecticides, and broad spectrum biocides that were developed for commercial agricultural production. DDT, the broad spectrum insecticide that is now infamous for its accumulation in the food web, still lingers in the water, as Rachel Carson predicted in 1962. Poisons disperse in plumes well beyond the intended targets. Petroleum byproducts, paints, solvents, glues, battery acid, and binding agents are accumulated in landfills seeding into waterway, waterways. As industrial chemicals react with each other, they become beside themselves with dissolution and being. Plastics spinning in the Pacific vortex can generate double death as birds, marine mammals, turtles, and fish try to eat them. If life and non life usually exist in a dynamic relationship, with gifts of energy and matter across time, processes, processes of double death are scaling up. They are starting to embrace and endanger planetary ecologies. Elizabeth Pominelli describes geological forces that show a planetary trend of becoming non-living. Life and non-life breathe in and breathe out. And if non-life is not life, a kernel of life may be returning to failure. Plantation economies, capital flows, and global war are producing a massive thanatological becoming. Forms of non-life are overcoming the living. Eugene Tanner argues that philosophers should abandon fundamental questions like questions like what is life and what is not life. Instead, Tiger is interested in the question of the life that becomes non life and other than life and coming non life. Writing in an avid spirit of animist exuberance in Byron Latter, the classic book of Big Power, Jane Bennett makes an argument for flattening of tolerance. Bennett suggests that differences between things like a dead rat, oak pollen, and plastic globe and a bottle cap need to be flattened right horizontally and as a juxtaposition rather than a verticality, the vertical is a vertical is a hierarchy of being. Bennett insists that everything is, in a sense, alive. Instead of sharing this enthusiasm, <clears throat> however, instead of sharing this enthusiasm about the liveliness of matter and thinking, oh my god, it's this, it's this, it's, it's moving. Is exuberant, uh, we are rather haunted by the ascending of death. Life is becoming non life and other than life in ongoing chains of destruction within precarious human and multi species world. Exposing and reconfiguring things in this new form of death is critical to planetary survival. And then, uh, if there is some more time, maybe I show you some. Um, the images where they try to wrap up and make some sense uh, of what yeah, I was talking we about. We have time, don't worry. Uh, we are okay. Slow okay. down. Yeah, I, I just feel guilty for the first one that comes out. Yeah. Um, like, I, I, I have been thinking a lot about the, like, the idea of uh, corruption, right? Like, and, and the composition, and what happens when it works and when it becomes this other, this. Uh, like again, and I think this is a little bit tender gift that I was trying to describe, and what happens when whatever kind of balance that it tries to achieve runs off kilter and it, it ends up um, like running amok. Um, I was thinking, these are just like some loose images that like, make me think of uh, corruption in general, many different systems. 
um, from the corruption of uh, files, from the corruption of bodies to the rate of poisoning, the corruption of computer languages, the corruption of uh, what, like the, um, what was usually thought about women that were having their period, that they, would, they could not uh, go into the kitchen because they would sour the milk. Um, things that turn into poison, um, like poisonings, uh, that have, like political poisonings that have happened recently, like, um, uh, what's his name, I'm, I'm blanking, Yushchenko, I believe, um, who was poisoned with uh, resin, I, I think, uh, not killed, but made an example of a living, uh, corrupted organism. <laughs> Thinking also about Alexander Litvinenko that got another beautiful volume, I think, was the, the gift that he got. Thinking about um, the rivers that become so incredibly polluted that they don't, they don't catch on fire. Um, thinking then, I mean, but it's also, I mean, like, of course it happens when it drops a rock, yeah, but we cannot think about an uncorruptible system because an uncorruptible, like, uh, I think the, the, one of the proofs of sainthood is that a body cannot corrupt, uh, the body is incorruptible. And the only, in, in, in the, the material research I have done on um, non corruptible things, I think the only, the, the, <laughs> the only thing I have found is um, McDonald's uh, Happy Meals. This actually stayed. Um, pretty much not corrupted for like 171 days. And then those things are also not, not living yet. And so, yeah, I've, I've had time to, to figure out um, like how to parse these things, how to work with them so that they are not only subject matter, so that it's possible to, to address not only the ideas of toxicity that were toxic commons, but really interfere with them and try to see if, if and how do we work with them. Um, these are some um, pretty brutal images of what people were trying to do with radio um, before they realized it was a poison. I think they would use it to cure rheumatism, gout, periodical headaches, neuralgia, Constipation, neurasthenia, auto intoxication, and lack of bodily vigor, uh, which I think is like a recognized, like a soft speech for the recognized function. And so, you were so coming. And then, um, one thing from this propaganda from the 1920s that um, was interesting to me was that this, um, that was product, I guess, that was called Ontar, which I found quite interesting because it was, it's not about opposing um, light to dark, but um, Ontar as an idea itself, right, which is still working with the darkness, not, not in a manner of dual opposition. So I guess that's a kind of way in which, which I have been thinking um, on how to work with the toxic commons that we live in, not, not just as uh, beings in a planet that's uh, pretty intoxicated, but also as inhabiting systems of power and hierarchies that are also toxic. Um, I don't want to get into the details of the toxicities in a particular art system, but there are many. And I, I mean, I keep trying to grab a lot to go in between subject matter to, to actually do it in something, anything that could really see through the power structures that are in place. Um, I guess, um, um, I mean, I've been obsessed with weights for, for a while. Um, I was uh, thinking about about it last time. Like, this is, a, I'm just going to close with a very modest example of a work that I made recently for an exhibition in um, the Netherlands, in Sonsberg, um, which was very much, very much inspired by um, uh, whale falls, that, which we saw before. And I was trying to think about how to make work that had um, not only uh, uh, 
sublime subject matter or whatever, uh, or an important subject matter, but actually that function in a, in a reasonable way. So I came up with a way a skeleton um, that also becomes a, that's in the middle of the park, that also becomes a host. So it's all seated and uh, over time it actually is going to be overrun with vegetation. Um, I was working with a garden to try to seed it and grow in it some of the more uh, delicate species that are um, living in that, in that uh, park. That's kind of like my image of uh, what it would be like, like um, thinking about uh, you know, reanimating, um, trying to give to give some gifts to the landscape so they have it. Um, and I guess um, I am um, close off with that.
and what is my relationship to my materials and to my field, what kind of propositions can I make, modest or not, to actually, I mean, fully make a difference, yeah? yeah. And to think that the only plight that matters is the human plight is confusing the board's work to trees yet again. We are great at that. That's, that's what we keep doing. Yeah? Like it's, I mean, if, if uh, it's not that one cares for the bees more than for the humans, but if the bees die, if, 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 if uh, bee colony disorder um, uh, goes rampant, there's no food. Yeah? If the soil goes, I mean, like right now we're supposed to have 60 years left of soil. Um, what's the word? Uh, of soil being productive. Yeah? Like it, it starts being less and less productive. And then what happens after 60 years, the soil in a third world country is completely barren and cannot grow anything anymore. Of course, all those, that's how you get these like, large amounts of people in Central America trying to go to the United States. Um, when, I mean, these ecological disasters create human disturbances. So it's not, it's, it, it's a, I mean, it's a very, um, late 20th century uh, leftist uh, way of thinking to focus only on the human life. I think that I would rather focus on the uh, entire, uh, you know, companion. I am the companion of many things, many things are my companions. And, uh, it's not possible to think that we save ourselves at the expense of everything else. Well, we will, uh, the idea is to just what causes these disasters, right? So humans do, uh, in a way. So that's what I'm trying to say. So rather than going after humans who uh, cause also these, uh, our inability to deal with nature, because in the end of the day it's governments, it's not. But it's also and then uh, we somehow often uh, deal with the consequences directly, not with the causes. But Let's open the, the, if anyone else has a, any questions, so that anyone, we don't turn this into a to conversation. Uh, no, let's continue. And then, uh, we, you know, we also produce these things by uh, a kind of like a cultural extraction, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the way which we relate to labor. Um, and I, I attempt to do this with examples, yeah? But, uh, I mean, the example is, I don't know, um, in, when I was a child, still in Mexico, um, I come from a poor family, and the way that my grandmother used to go to the market, go to the supermarket the market, was with a bag that she used and reused and reused and reused and reused. And then, at some point in my childhood, she was made ashamed of her bag because that stuff was kind of like that. When I get up, like single use plastics, what, well, you know, you can just have a plastic bag. Why do you keep gathering that like ratty bag around? It's like ancient, just get a plastic bag. And so she didn't teach me how to make those bags. She just made it herself. I don't know how to make a bag like that. Now, um, people of uh, the social class of my grandmother like, are stuck with that single use plastic bags. And uh, there are people uh, in the creative industries, let's say, that are making very nice, eco sustainable, beautiful bags that you can use and reuse, minus the fact that the bag that my grandmother made was probably the price at a dollar, let's say, and those eco-sustainable, fantastic, beautiful bags are 50 euros. So they are not available. That, that kind of knowledge is, same that, yeah? But that kind of knowledge was taken away from us, uh, from an entire class of people, and it's now, I mean, all kinds of technologies, construction technologies, ways of living, with how to do it. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, and those are ex also extractive processes yeah, that, that um, change also, of course, you know, like the labor of my grandmother making the bag was considered very cheap, the labor of a creative person making the bag, at the time of that person is worth, uh, it's, it's, it's paid at an entirely different rate. Time has changed as well. Time? It's like, um, 
Yeah, I couldn't want to say that I guess that um, kind of environmental discourse. Um, it seems also there's yeah, a rather kind of moralized, good, bad version of or understanding of you know, environmental crisis of um, you know, the bad guys, the you know, corporations, oil industries, etc. that cause destruction, um, harm, entropy. Um, I'm curious sort of, kind of to through your talks, I think how can we relate maybe differently or think differently? What is kind of other ways you viewed as negative, as bad, as evil, wrong? How can that be reconsidered as you know also something that potentiates new makings, new connections, new forms of production? Uh, I mean I think I always think that you know like grand solutions are not particularly uh, well suited for this kind of problem. Um, that they were like, more modest ways of thinking are in order. And, you know, producing world is like small, is like something that you can, I mean, I don't know, like, uh, how do you relate to your materials, you know? How do you relate to the structures that you inhabit? What kind of, I mean, the, if, if there is a, a kind of um, current situation, are we post pandemic, are we in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, whatever we are? Um, it, it's, it highlights the existence of these toxic commons and, and one has to make do. Yeah? It's, I mean, placing guilt or doing moral, uh, moralizing judgments is, uh, again, this is something that I was talking about with my with the participants in my seminar, is like trying to say, okay, so there, are, there is a big, I mean, with the fires and the floods and the plagues and so on, it's very tempting to go into biblical discourse. Yeah? Images coming in. And it's quite important to, to, to remember that there is a difference between apocalypse and extinction. And apocalypse is something that is loaded with moralizing. It's, it's basically it's all about cost, it's all about judgment. The, the, the good people go to the left, and the bad people go to the right. And somebody is going to separate the wheat from the chaff, and like whatever, uh, some magic afterlife, and the chariots happen. Fire and so on. It's all about us. And an extinction is a lot more indifferent and it has, it has no more of what. Yeah? It, it, it cuts through. Um, and I mean, the, regardless of whatever, uh, how it ends, the, the, it's, it's just a group of the thing that like, the emissions and the things that we have done is basically all done within one lifetime. Yeah? This, this, this all has happened since the second, uh, what, what's called the post war. Like, is the part of the aftermath of the Second World War. So it's, uh, I mean, so it has taken one lifetime to get here. I don't know how many lifetimes it will take or it would take to fix it, but you know, I guess one addresses these things one day, one action at a time, one artwork at a time, one try to think, okay, so how, I mean, clearly it's not enough to to make, you know, to turn things into subject matter. Subject matter is really just a gloss. Um, I mean, it's, and you know, like, I, I don't know how to, I mean, I cannot find any, any um, overarching like, blanket solution to this. Not sure that I think I'm an artist that's just very concerned about these things. Nor should you, I mean, like, it's, I guess it's also, it's only something about, um, I mean, like dealing with it in the, in the, in the deep present somehow. Is uh, 
what is your approach to that information? Do you try to, to get a kind of uh, fact, factual uh, <coughs> status of uh, things that you address? Or it's just as a kind of starting point or graphic example for your stories? Um, I think it varies the approach. I mean, like if I'm working, like for example, when I'm working with an anthropologist, everything is very rigorous because that's part of the discipline, it's like a lot of research. When I'm working alone, um, I use uh, story, I mean, like the, for example, the video about the Gradient Girls, the story is 100% uh, 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 fact, it happened, I'm quoting them, the quotes are uh, uh, taken, taken, written, from, taken from newspapers. Um, and I, I take an approach um, where, of course, I'm trying to produce an affect, and I'm overlaying an affect uh, over a factual story. Just one small remark. Being an artist is a powerful position. So not to disregard that you're just an artist. That means a lot, actually. It's not a small... It's, no, it, is a it depends how you use it, but it is a powerful position in, almost in any society. I mean, you know, I try to say and, because... Uh, yeah. Just so yeah, but you're, and you're right. I mean, we produce meanings and we produce chains of symbols and, and new symbols and new meanings and things that are actually quite important and that become anchoring points um, in ways of seeing the world, let's say. I, I think when I say that is because if I am going to go deeper into um, examining toxicities, I tend to resent when the common demand for artists to offer solutions to these broad spectrum problems when we are actually living or inhabiting a field that is mired in its own toxicity and that it has, you know, which, which artist has uh, health insurance, pension plan, reliable paycheck, and yet we are supposed to imagine what a better world is when we cannot clean our own house. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. But, I mean, I don't feel that um, the demand of like asking an artist to fix those things. I, I can offer images, meanings, complaints, crit uh, criticisms, and thoughts, but as as for proper solutions, I don't want to have policy making and <laughs> the government uh, job outsourced to artists. Yeah, that's that's how it goes. Yeah, but this is not a general rule. You're not setting. A a path, you know, so basically there are, there are no limits to any profession, actually, if a doctor can be a uh, president, so, so an artist can be the same, because, I, 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 so I, I, there are no limitations, what there are individual said, approaches, what, and... What's the and, name of the uh, Iranian... Prime Minister? Yeah. Uh, Idi Rama, but yeah. that's, a, that's an example, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is there are no, no limits, you know, the sky no, is... Of course, it's, I mean, it's not about saying yeah. that just an artist, but I'm, I'm saying that like actually well, like an artist. Exactly. I mean, it's a larger yeah. discussion, but let's keep it there if, if we can, because we have the, the other presentation okay. uh, lined up. But I uh, thank you very much. Uh, please continue with the discussion. We'll have a five minute break until we connect uh, the other presentation. Thank you so much.